Uh, Sophia, do you want to take the next slide then? Guy Standing's arguments for the precariat as a class, distinctive relations of distribution. Income, Standing notes, comes in a wide variety of forms. Own account production, income from production or selling to a market, money wages, enterprise non-wage benefits, community and solidarity benefits, state benefits, and income from financial and other assets. The distinctive characteristic of the precariat is that it lacks access to all non-money wage sources of income. During the 20th century, the trend was away from money wages with a rising share of social income coming from enterprise and state benefits. What distinguishes the precariat is the opposite trend with sources of income other than wages virtually disappearing. For Wright, the critical issue here is the increased vulnerability people face when their material standing of living comes entirely from money wages. The standard of living of the working class remains underwritten by forms of income other than money wages, even though these may be declining in the era of austerity. For the precariat, these benefits have largely disappeared. The combination of employment instability and income vulnerability defines the economic precarity of the precariat. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about this. Because the thing is, like, even if you are a worker who is not in steady employment and, and you don't have, like, a regular benefits package, I wouldn't say it's the case that, like, you have virtually no sources of income other than wages in the sense that, like, the state doesn't provide anything to you right because it's like well yeah but like the roads are still getting paved you know like depending on the country you're living in you might still have access to some form of public health insurance which isn't tied to your workplace even though it's probably pretty shitty and it's not as good as what a worker who has insurance through their workplace would get it, it just doesn't seem quite right to me that this is the case like the, the the value of that package may have decreased to a considerable extent, but I just don't think it is like virtually disappearing. It I don't I don't think it's it's quite that extreme in most places, although it, it probably is in some. Yeah, we just have a a comment in the chat here from uh, Anarchidi saying, "Also, I feel as if the family unit is taking the place of the state support network much more." Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's definitely like one of the social engineering goals of neoliberalism that was successful, right? There is no such thing as society, right? There are only individuals and families, is the, the Margaret Thatcher quote. And that's exactly what the point is, to, to make people dependent on their families. Yeah, that's a general trend. And people that negotiated their contracts, you know, in the fucking 1950s, you know, yeah, their lives look a lot different. <laughs> uh, Sophia, do you want to try the next slide then as well? Try the distinctive relations to the state. Sure. Guy Standing's arguments for the precariat as a class to distinctive relations to the state. Standing builds his analysis around the contrast between citizens and denizens. Citizens are people with full rights granted by the state. Denizens are mere residents who live under the jurisdiction of the state, but with much more limited rights. Traditionally, non-citizen migrants were denizens in this sense. They had permission to live somewhere, but with a much more limited set of politically guaranteed rights. This condition has now been extended to a significant number of people who formerly remained citizens. In contrast, for the working class, these rights remain largely intact. While some segments of the working class may share some of these characteristics, taken together, they constitute the precariat as a distinct class according to standing. This does not mean there are no divisions within the precariat. In the second decade of the 21st century, standing argues the precariat in the developed capitalist world is internally divided into three main subcategories. Those who were previously firmly within a working class but who have been marginalized by the trajectory of capitalist development, those who are traditionally considered denizens, migrants, Roma, ethnic minorities, asylum seekers, some of the disabled, and a growing number of ex-cons, 
And lastly, the dynamic core of the precariat, consisting of the educated, plunge into a precarious existence after being promised the opposite, a bright career of development and satisfaction. Most are in their 20s and 30s. Many drifting out of the accelerated existence are joining them. All three segments experience a deep sense of deprivation, but the focus of this is different in each case. The first part experiences it relative to a recent or imagined past. The second, relative to an absent present, an absent home. And the third relates to a feeling of having no future. These differences generate serious divisions that undermine the capacity of the precariat to act collectively as a class. Standing thinks the precariat is divided to such an extent that one could describe it as a class at war with itself. Yet in spite of this, he believes that it has the potential to become a dangerous class, much more capable than the working class of challenging the mainstream political agendas of the 20th century, the neoliberalism of the mainstream right, and the laborism of social democracy. So what do we think about this distinction between citizens and denizens with respect to the precarious? I think that distinction like by itself is pretty useful because there is this weird bait and switch with universal suffrage always in bourgeois states that should be kind of like, you know, if you're really thinking about all people, the set of all people in the United States, you should mean all. And so, you know, in terms of political rights, that's just not how it works. So I think it is like an important kind of distinction, but I guess I disagree with the whole point of bringing it up is that like, I don't know that it has a lot to do with employment standing necessarily like citizenship is a weird you know it it, it certainly has a huge impact on economic market market segmentation but it is a non-economic variable essentially like it's a political kind of conferment like you could just be born in the right place and have it by law what's really strange about this what's really strange about this segment is that there's a conflation of legal legal reality versus feeling alienated by the political process, right? So for category one and category three, people formerly within a working class and the educated who feel they have no future and who are downwardly mobile, you know, based on the information given to us, they still have the same political rights as a citizen, right? Like assuming that they were born right, here, yeah, yeah, yeah. they can vote, they have the same like legal protections. But to compare that to asylum seekers, migrants, Roma, the disabled, I mean, even the disabled, like, like you see what I'm saying? Like it's yeah, not it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really make much sense well, to me. Like... You see, these are part of the new dangerous class, which here doesn't mean lumpen, which sometimes it does, but you know, I guess in this case it doesn't, but they have different interests and are actually set against each other, but they're part of the same class. Okay. You know, and on, honestly, like, I think, you know, if we look at say Roma ethnic minorities, asylum seekers who are considered denizens, like, you know, that seems to be something that is like a very, you know, nearly like a static constant in capitalism, as opposed to, it's not like these Roma or, you know, Irish travelers or take or pick, I think when our asylum seekers, like it's, it's suddenly a new thing of, that they're in the precariat or they're, they've changed, you know, there's a change in their status, you know, no, this, anything is way been... for, this is a way for number three to discuss their like loss in status, essentially, mm -hmm. um, is to compare themselves to number one people that would have had a more comfortable working class existence in like the, you know, the Springsteen days or something. And now it's not like that. Or two, you know, like this is in a long revolutionary intellectual tradition being like, we're just like slaves, man. We're the wretched of the earth right now because I can't find a job, you know, being a like, you know, a, I don't know, professor of like rectal literature in the 19, 1940s. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like that's, it's, it's, it's very strange. I keep wanting to say it's of its time. I feel like a fucking broken record. But it is. It's painfully like 2010s. 
I want to I want to say it reflects this like moment in history where the left wasn't developed and consistent and analytical. But now where I see where things are developing, you know, <laughs> like 15 years later or whatever, like I understand, the, you know, the gulf that's always going to exist in like, you know, what's hot in theory or something versus something that would be useful. And, you know, the real like just the most dismissive I can be is that like, I think. Gilles Deleuze said that it's the philosopher is like a friend to the concept, but like in, in a sense, like in the sense that the word is, is the death of the thing, the philosopher that really likes to create new words is the enemy of the concept. It's like, they're trying to create, they're trying to pop a concept, but they actually pop as a word and the word is a brand and the brand gets spread around and it actually means different things to different people. The way precariat was used was never consistent among people that used it. And it was sort of used to like differentiate themselves from the proletariat, but also to position themselves as, you know, either part of this underclass or kind of like the proletariat that is locked out of a good proletarian life. Like, I think like the precariat, well, it's supposed to be a noun. It, it in fact, was actually used as an adjective, you know, like it was like, like it was more like, you know, like it was to just do it. It was literally just, you know, precarity or whatever like it was never oh, okay. well, you know what i mean yeah. it was never really yeah. even if people say oh the precarious it's just that just meant oh some people who are kind of precarious in a precarious situation and little more than that i think as we can see from how things are kind of clumsily lumped together here but what i did like in the last paragraph was that i do think it it, it that the these movements of the parts of the working class into worse economic relations does pose a challenge to the to the mainstream political agendas. I do think that is true, but you know whether that how that will shape up that material trend will have a political impact. I guess it's telling that like I don't know if it's the greatest longing, but one of the the only like sensible institutional response to the powerlessness of precarity is some kind of radical union movement that tries to not exclude people from the proletariat. <laughs> so in that respect, it's so hard for me to put down this, like, not that, you know, there are, aren't other worthwhile forms of activism, but most of those don't form a, some, something that's capable of, like, tackling this problem or to tackling the problem that it wants. Even the most, like, radical stuff, like, you know, in the United States, the sort of bureaucratic layer it leaves behind is totally unaccountable. And, you know, you end up with more theory like this. Yeah, we've, we've yet to see anything politically promising, <laughs> but it'll still yeah, even, see political even, effects. Even the union efforts are, you know, uh, Chris Smalls, who seems to be a, a good union organizer in, in the United States when it's almost impossible. You know, there's all this, like, there's been a you know bad press run recently. And of course, I'm sure there's, you know, some yellow journalistic aspects to this. Someone running a hit job for Bezos. But on the other hand, you know, I believe in the contemporary media environment you know, being a labor hero might go to your head pretty quick. What, what we need to discuss, though, is Chomsky going to private meals with Jeffrey Epstein and Woody oh, Allen. Man. Like, oh, my good Jesus. You mean to tell me that Chomsky Foucault was pedo versus pedo the whole time? The oh, whole time. God. Oh, oh man. no. Oh, man. Is that, is, it's it's like true. Left intellectuals just cut it out. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of shocking. Yeah, I, I, I'm shocked. I genuinely am shocked. Yeah, no. He, he doesn't I, strike me as the, the kind of person who, you know, he's like your, your wholesome grandfather. Like, I don't, I never would have guessed. He's like a big free speech guy, I guess. And like, you know, That's always a bad sign. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Like, I mean, free speech is important, but not in not the bastardized version well, that. Yeah, it's often. That's the problem. You can you know you should respond to different intellectual climates in different ways, and like right, uh, not the sixties anymore, my guy. Yeah, you know when J.K. Rowling was going to be censored somewhere, like you know he, Chomsky put his name down. To uh, you know, make sure she could like be represented because of free speech. You know, th things like this. Like when the political climate gets different, like people that were sort of paragons start looking more and more shady. Is um, that really all it is, though? 
Yeah, right? I, I think I think the thing about Chomsky that was always like a bit like off putting was just the guru status he had and like mm-hmm. his you know, just like sort of the way that he carried himself as a public intellectual, as somebody who's like just sort of right by nature of being Noam Chomsky. And that th- that thing is kind of a little bit, you know, I guess something that 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 lumps him in with these like high powered pedophiles that were like connected to Epstein in the sense of just having that ego and and that that status. I mean, like at minimum, this guy was willing to pal around with Epstein after his after like uh, an early conviction. When asked yeah. about it, he was basically like, "Well, you know, he served his time." Like. Seriously, like that's like the dumbest fucking line of all time. Like, I mean, would he would if, he make the if, same if, thing if, about hanging around a no. clansman? If you didn't know, it would be one thing. Like, man, I don't know. I was just going to dinner. With but he's going to Woody dinner, with, like with Woody, Woody, Woody Allen. Yeah, what, what, yeah. What, yeah. What, 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 yeah. What, what, what does it mean? What, what, no, no, no. This is the yeah. This is the your whole what? point was to talk to these fucking. Freaks, oh. man! I used to be such no. a big Woody Allen fan. I mean, I was in. I used. I was like, I watched every film. I knew every joke. I fucking loved Woody Allen, and it took a yeah. while for like, like it took me like a while. What oh, I watched man. like those documentaries, and then you're just like, oh, now I can't look at it. I can't see anything. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. like, like, yeah. but I don't know Woody yeah. Allen. I'm not actually even when I was a right. fan. You're I wasn't friends with them. Yeah, somebody wasn't saying to me, "Do you want to come to visit Woody Allen?" And I'd be like, "You know, I'd be even then when I was a big fan, I'd be like, oh, I don't know, like Woody's a bit of a, you know, yeah. like and and Chomsky's like going there with a convicted pedo. I mean, like, oh my god, it's so bad. <laughs> I just think it's fucking terrible. So I, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I think all this to say, like, left intellectual culture is not all right, and maybe like. This has to do with why the precariat was a thing. Like it just, it, there's a vibe that it has, and it kind of lets intellectuals lump themselves in with, you know, two groups of people that are frankly more mar- mar- more marginal. Uh, yeah, well, because the thing is, the thing is, like, okay, so like, you know, the the folks, the, the people who are like these, you know, download, like, uh, what was the description in the previous slide? There, uh, Tom was these downwardly mobile the so-called dynamic core uh, <laughs> of the precariat plunged into a precarious existence after being promised the opposite opposite a bright career of development and satisfaction 20s to 30s drifting out of this or many drifting out of the celery existence or joining them like that's like the this, ifc like you know target market <laughs> like, that's not yeah class yeah like, yeah 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 and like and like this like group of people it's like okay you know uh definitely was at this time was i one of these people yeah absolutely i was oh yeah, yeah. um it's like yeah it sucked it was awful i'm still like i'll never you know compared to other generations of people I'm never going to recover economically from the period of time that this is describing, right? Yeah. And, you know, in addition to being disabled and so on and so on. But, like, it, it is, I still have generational wealth, you know? Like, it's not a lot, but I do have it. And it's very, 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 very different from group two and to a large extent, group one as well. And and I'm and right the, the, you, no. that makes a big difference. No, I mean that's just old school class stuff. That's just like normal property. You don't have to like be real fancy about it. And is like okay. So is is precariat another way to you know hide generational wealth? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I also have a little bit of generational wealth. It's like you know I'm like too. That's like, and if you're, if you really nose around the left, you're going to find a lot of generational wealth. Just any like right, sure. subcultural like group is going to have that. Like, it's just the way it is. The right's the same way. It, it, yeah. Sometimes fancy new class analysis makes me wonder if they're just sort of laundering economic baggage in, in a way. Well, I think the thing is like, okay, you know, honestly, 
it's clear in the wake of the 2007 eight crisis that people like us were politically radicalized by being thrown into more precarious economic situation and seeing like the world structures around us that we were brought up to believe in like exposed as lies in ways that were very like tangible and material to us right but like right. well then what do we do that doesn't make us a well, new class really right, right. it's, we, it's we like, yeah yeah we like acted out kind of like you know councilism without jobs right <laughs> and then we we formed jacobin and then when that and and we ran a candidate and then with them when that didn't work we formed a bunch of cults and internet silos right like that doesn't feel very dangerous it feels very tame when we were mentioning occupy wall street earlier and what year it was in just so i could check I, I looked at the wiki and I thought the first sentence was extremely funny. Occupy Wall Street was a 59 day left wing populist movement. <laughs> 59 day. Well, this, 59 this, uh, day. Napoleon this, did 100 and we couldn't even do fi- we couldn't even do that. We were only 59. Damn. We didn't get to do the dance when we beat the commune. Um, we didn't even get to 69. It, oh, whatever. Oh. Occupy oh, Oakland. Occupy Oakland uh, was was more hardcore. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to be that person, but uh, shit just kept going there for like a year. <laughs> like, yeah, it was. It was. It was. I don't know if it was like a permanent occupation, but that that uh that article is Occupy Wall Street. How long did the initial camp uh last uh, for? Sure. In defense yeah, that- of my of my comrades in the movement. I, I feel like our reaction towards Occupy has spawned something, you know, honestly, like just sort of reflecting over my political heritage. Like, I think a lot of the return of like totalitarianism is uh, some frustration with like how things like the anti globalization movement and Occupy went and being like, well, you know, you can't be in them, join them in a sense. And I really feel like something is lost by the transition from one to the other there's a part of me well, that almost misses the heady days of this kind of autonomy yeah i mean we talked about this a lot in like covering like neither vertical nor horizontal the nunes book right and it's kind yeah. of all about this question and and i think the thing is that when you have this turn towards like resurrecting leninism like the cult shit trying to do the kautsky neo stuff, all these kind of party efforts, it's very much like looking at the num- like the numbers of the mass political movements that existed in the past, seeing those as successes, and then trying to emulate the form without any core that would enable them to succeed, right? Like, it, it, it is very much like the fundamental sort of like mass base of a mass party did not exist and these groups tried to sort of conjure it into existence as a like response to the failures of the anti-globalization movement of the occupy movement but fundamentally like the problems that underlie those periods were still there and couldn't be magicked away. And, and so, it, it, yeah, I don't know. It, it, I understand where the reaction comes from, but like swinging in the opposite direction and emulating past, I don't know if you call them successes, but at least like notable moments <laughs> without the same conditions existing, you know, it, it does feel like a very knee jerk reflex. And I, and like, I could, at the time, I kind of, I never involved myself with these groups very much, but I could kind of like get the impulse of like, I was never like hostile to the Occupy movement, but I did feel like it wasn't very well organized. It wasn't very well able to adapt to situations and trying something different seemed like a good idea and using Marxist theory seemed like a good idea. But I don't know if I was ever really on board with like, and therefore we must be neo kautskyists or and therefore we must be neo-Leninists. Like, it's just, 
I, I didn't see that as the answer, but it did seem like it was sort of moving in, in a direction that was promising. Yeah, what, what I got out of, you know, so-called neo-Katskyism was this sense that we do need some sort of institutional legacy if the, you know, proletariat's going to stand a chance, like, but like, what kind of institutional legacy? Is it going to be a political one or does there need to be some innovation on economic form when the conditions are right in, you know, a life where you know, economics is not in your political control? That's not how that works. Like you, you have to have like a respect for. Well, yeah, but that's like the most happen. Leninist thing, right? Is to be like, yeah, of course. Actually, the economics don't matter. We will just well, do it right. by because political we'll just fiat. Do it <laughs> out of will, because Lenin invents, you know, a current that is better used in its right-wing capitalist management variant. It just is like it just it's more adapted to the purpose. The one-party state you know, the political legacy of Lenin. That's yeah. why all those, why all those neocons are all extras. Yeah. Right. Well, we go on. We take the next slide. Oh, let me, let me have a go at this one. The precariat's place in class analysis. There is little doubt that precariousness among a num along a number of dimensions has increased as a condition of life in developed capitalist countries. The question remains how this phenomenon should be understood conceptually. Standing refers to the precariat as a class in the making, in deference to the fact that it does not yet act as a unified collective actor. It is not yet a class for itself, in the traditional Marxist terms. Nevertheless, he argues it is a distinct class location in terms of its structural location within the class structure of capitalism, differentiated from the working class and the other classes in his inventory. He acknowledges overlap between the precariat and parts of the working class, if these conditions are taken one by one. But if it is taken as a whole, these characteristics generate a real boundary of demarcation. Standing is dismissive of scholars, in particular Marxists, who disagree that the precariat is a class. The question is whether or not sharing this set of socio-economic characteristics elaborated by Standing is sufficient to describe a social category as a class? What precisely are the criteria by which we can answer this question? Well, and it's barely even a social category. It's more like, like a political conjuncture, right? Like, oh, you've got these three groups, they're disenfranchised, and maybe they could get together and do something. Is that, is that really a social category? It seems like, you know, just sort of a, a moment in history. It just seems like there was, like, people were looking around after Occupy and being like, something's different. And Guy Standing was just like, well, it's a class. This is a different class. Well, I don't know. Think about how, like, the relation of work to Occupy. Get a job, right? It's not, not a classical workers movement. This is what, I don't know. Again, like, for, if, if you're familiar with Marxist theory... You know, there's this, there's a whole body of literature from, you know, like the 30s, like onward, that's like cumulative within Marxism, where it's hard to deny that the, the historical anarchists had a point <laughs> about the way that, you know, class structure was going to shake out. And so you need a more expansive view of class interest than the nationalist one that's going to form up where the workers are the defender of the nation i think we know where that goes um, well yeah but like and like also like isn't that kind of the logical outcome of this analysis right like we need right. to reinforce national citizenship rights in conjunction with employment security like does seem kind of like a chauvinistic workers movement would be the logical objective of this group yeah, hundred percent. And like, it nearly feels like to me that, like, you know, you can imagine him thinking, like, oh yeah, let's let's lump. What's the previous slide here where we have, uh, you know, the three different slices of the precariat? It's like let's lump like the uh, educated people who now are working in Starbucks or struggling to get a job in Starbucks in with like the Roma and you know the asylum seekers, and like that'll really piss them off. 
let them, and then if they think about themselves like that, then we can like organize them to like defend, you know, get those national kind of ideas of citizenship. I I really feel like, you know, in Europe, like Roma or or, or travelers are like they're they're treated so badly. It's like even like versus unemployed people, they're treated badly. You could be a working Roma and be treated worse than like an unemployed English person. So it's like. You know, it just it does strike me like you're saying, Kyle, as a really it's just very chau- chauvinistic. Uh, it reminds me of you know when the American like revolutionaries would talk about being taxed and compare themselves to slaves. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, a hundred percent. Fine, a fine like revolutionary tradition. <laughs> right, it's nearly like like to associate like you with your PhD in like weird branch of philosophy who can't get a job. And like that you you are put in the, in contradistinction with the Roma person that it's like going to be politically motivating to you. You know, it's nearly done as, as a shock, you know, shock mm. therapy to the to, the, to those people. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I don't know if it's if it's supposed to be shock territory. I think it's supposed to resonate with their sense that they were promised the world and haven't been given the world. And therefore, they've had something material taken from them. And that's not not actually the case. They were just sort of like a, ideologically misled about how things were going to shake out, you know, the materiality of the situation is, you know, like extremely variable. One thing I will say is that a lot of the like Starbucks organizers are these kinds of people, but once they, and once they go to work at Starbucks, no matter how like cringe and mumble core, you might find their background, like, unless we're going to be like hard Stalinist that, you know, class is assigned at birth and it's like genetic. Um, <laughs> a sign pull at birth. Yeah, sign pull at birth. I mean, <laughs> that is how Stalinism works. Like your class origin was your like sort of class essence, and it was unchangeable. And it's biology, not hate. Like <laughs> essentially. Mm. So once once that person you know gives up on being a you know professor of nineteenth century recta literature, and and decides just to serve coffee and you know do a podcast for the rest of their life, wh- where are they on the class ladder? Like. Is it relations of production or not? Because if you're a service worker, I think you're a proletarian. And especially if you start like unionizing in that position. And, you know, so, okay, so unionizing does come from people who have like, in you know, like some of the union movements have been in like coffee shops and shit like that. The other place you see union movements are in these Amazon warehouses. Um, that And that is in, you know, section one of the precariat, I suppose, to the extent that we're going to grant the premise that you know people working in a warehouse under precarious conditions that they get like some benefits like if, if we can grant that this is like a, a type of some type some new thing instead of you know reshoring contemporary capitalist working conditions then if yeah if we can get behind that then we can say something like Categories one and three have been so vanguards of unionization. Okay. And then in two, you know, people that don't have like recognized national status and like ethnic minorities have like, I would say ethnic minorities excluding like the Roma because uh, the Roma don't really do nationalism because they don't want to lose their, you know, uh, more clan tribal identities. So it doesn't really work for them, but there is a bunch of sort of ethnic nationalist movements like that are, you know, essentially trying to politically devolve their countries. There is sort of like a sense to what he's saying in that these will be the active sectors, you know, forgive me of the proletariat, right? (laughs) Coming next. And, you know, also like, you know, like I said all that without even really mentioning George Floyd rebellion in the United States, like, you know, so there there is like some sense that like these are the sectors that you're going to see like political activity from in an in an emancipatory capacity, and you know probably could be extended beyond that. It feels like this this kind of this literature, this book is a harbinger of what's to come, but it's just so wrong, in a sense. It's so it's so off, but it, it's pointing towards something that's different about the shape that rebellion is going to take in the 21st century it's not quite in the developed capitalist world it's not quite the same as like 
muscle guy with hammer in a factory. It is the barista or organizing the union. It is the where Amazon warehouse worker organizing the union. It is, you know, ethnic and national minorities standing up to oppression and, and violence. Uh, no, 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 no. Um, not it's, even it's, necessarily it's, just in the economic sphere, but right. just in general. Yeah, it's the pieces are all there. The you know, guy standing is just not putting them together correctly. He is pointing to some sectors that are going to pop off, and I mean, if you're looking on the right. Um, you know, sector one, you know, we, we used to be a proper country you know, kind of people like that. You know, they're not they're not all petty bourgeois like shopkeepers or something. Some of them are people that would have been working class, like people that would have, you know, probably, you know, voted labor, but ended up voting Tory. That kind of thing. People who think Disney is uh, the devil. Yeah, but the working class variant, the, yeah. the, the compact magazine wet dream. Of, <laughs> you know. No, those people exist, actually, for sure. Things are falling into place. We have Elon Musk. He's bought Twitter. The final revolutionary kind of key that's going to mm-hmm. bring us all the way towards total emancipation and the destruction of alienated labor. Yeah, what do you reckon? I mean, yeah, I, I, like, obviously, I think, um, you know, Elon, the angry, angry, many times dad and husband living in his fraudulent mini house for a little while owning twitter destroying the entire corporation and continuing to make a bunch of fake products is is definitely the the vanguard that we need in this time uh russell brand elon alliance i I don't know what what's russell brand up to these days he's gone off the deep end He's become. I think. I think he's. I think he's bought into a lot of like right wing conspiracy theories. Yeah. Uh, well, he'll always have a home on Twitter, I guess, with views like that. So uh, as long as Twitter exists, like, yeah, I just come back to the idea that that what uh, Standing is describing is that is is really just a political situation at the time he was writing, and the the categories he's describing are really not that novel like if you kind of think about them in the sort of traditional sense of like okay you got the workers the proles right you got the disenfranchised um the marginalized the excluded the denizens and you've got like the radicalized students right the students who learned a bunch of radical stuff and then couldn't get a job or they 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 aspired to a uh, a social status that would come with their education and they couldn't get it. These have often been sort of volatile social elements that can cause change. And yeah, I just, I just think he's more identifying like a particular political situation that could go on to cause changes and disruptions more so than he's describing anything like a class. 